my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling Hello, everyone. Welcome to Beyond Your Wild Genes podcast. This is Dr. Wanda Lee, and on behalf of my two partners, Dr. Michael and Dr. Noah, I have the distinct pleasure of making a very special announcement today. On behalf of our sister company, Beyond Your Wildest Genes Academy, we have a new program to launch, and this one is just for you, ladies. It is getting to goddess. It's your turn. We know that you're looking for ways to retain youth and vitality, to get energy and feminine power, and to build health for you and your family. You have an inner goddess. Have you seen her lately? She knows how to care for herself so she can take care of others. She has time and balance in her days, weeks, months, and years. Your inner goddess nourishes herself and those she loves, both inside and out. And your inner goddess creates the relationships and the space in her life to bring her dreams, her talents, and her passions to others. Your inner goddess is waiting, and we're here to help you uncover her. It's time to wake up your inner goddess, and our four-week online program combines proven information, science, and simple, effective strategies to build your energy, regain your balance, and find your purpose. It's time for you, so let us help. For more information, go to our website, beyondyourwildestgenes.com. Click on the Beyond Your Wildest Genes Academy link and find Getting to Goddess. Or you can get there directly at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com backslash getting-to-goddess. We hope you enjoy it as much as we've enjoyed making this program. We have poured our hearts and souls into this course, and we can't wait for you to benefit from it. So thank you again for being part of our Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast tribe, and we hope you enjoy this week's podcast release. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I am your co-host. Today I'm super excited to have Breakaway Matcha founder Eric Gower as our guest. Eric, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Noah, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. You know, you know, when I reached out to you, I mentioned that I received a jar of Breakaway Matcha cold brew in one of my quarterly boxes And I've been using the product since, you know, ironically, at that same time, I was looking for a quality matcha that had travel sticks uh, because my wife loves matcha tea. She just loves it. It's her favorite drink. Mm -hmm. Uh, She has several glasses a day. So I'd like to give a shout out. This podcast is in dedication to my matcha loving wife, (laughs) Karen. And I have a great deal of gratitude to your matcha loving wife as well. (laughs) All right. So let me do your quick bio and we're going to dive right in. Eric is an author, ghostwriter, editor, tea entrepreneur, cooking instructor, and private chef. He's the author of four cookbooks and the founder of a specialty tea company, Breakaway Matcha. He lives and works in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. What do you have to say about your bio? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's an an eclectic one. Uh, The only thing I would add is that there was a big chunk of of time in Japan. I I lived there for 16 years. Uh-huh. And that's where I got to know and about matcha and, and took my deep dive into matcha. You know, you know, the funny thing is, is that I'm 42, and for people my age, I think the first introduction to any kind of tea like that was probably Karate Kid Tube when we saw, <laughs> right, when we saw that tea ceremony. And you know, that's I right. think ever since then, I've uh, I've had a little bit of an interest, and, and even more so now that I know how important polyphenols are for your your health and your diet. So I'm going to I'm going to call this podcast today Matcha 101. Does that sound good? Perfect. That sounds great. All right. So my first question for you, and it's the same question I ask every guest, is how about your journey? Can you share a little bit about it? You mentioned the 16 years in Japan, but how, how did that all happen? Yeah, um, it's kind of a it's kind of a weird story, and oddly, it, it is related to matcha. Um, so when I was a young lad, uh, I, I moved out to California, and I was I found myself in Los Angeles, and and on Sundays I used to take some hiking trips around it. And there's a there's a mountain about an hour east of Los Angeles called Mount Baldy, and Mount Baldy uh, it is the home of of uh, the Mount Baldy Zen Center. And I, I sort of stumbled into this place one day. It was this really cool series of of little kind of strange square Japanese buildings. Um, and I was wondering what the heck it was because I was in the middle of this mountain just hiking, and there it was. And inside were a bunch of uh, bald-headed guys in robes 
uh, cooking, cooking lunch. And they invited me in and I had lunch with them. And uh, I, I became fast friends with them and, and started started sitting uh, meditation with them, uh, Zazen. And eventually I met their teacher, um, a guy named Sasaki, and he was an older Japanese man. Uh, back then he was in his 80s. Uh, he just died recently. Uh, he died at 108, I believe. Um, and this guy couldn't speak a lick of English. And so I, I thought, geez, I better start studying Japanese if I want to talk to him. So I, I did and um, wound up majoring in uh, uh, a, a major called Modern Japanese Literature at, at Berkeley. It's the only, con- only place in the country that offered such a thing. And um, after that, I, I, uh, within a couple of weeks, I, I had moved to Japan. I moved to Kyoto. And uh, they do teach you how to read Japanese pretty well in these programs, but they don't teach you how to speak all that well. <laughs> so I thought I would just go for a year or two and uh, try to get my spoken Japanese uh, a little better. And, uh, you know, one year turned into two, and then it turned into five, and then it turned into ten. And after 16, uh, you know, my, my time there had, had come to an end, and I moved back to California. So that's kind of it in a, in a very brief nutshell. That's fascinating. Uh, what, in your 16 years, in, did you run a restaurant? What, did you just go to school? What did you do there? No, no. I, I had a I had an odd career. Um, I, I I still do this job to this day. Um, I worked for the prime minister of Japan uh, in the cabinet office as basically a kind of copy editor. Really, uh, anything that they publish in English tends to make its way to my email box, and uh, I I write some commentary on it and uh, send it back. And just wait for the next one to arrive. And I've been doing this since 1987. Wow, that's that's cool. That's really neat. <laughs> so so let's dive right in. Yeah. What what is matcha? Matcha is just green tea. I mean, there's nothing nothing more simple you could say about it. It's it's one of the world's oldest plants, the Camellia sinensis. And uh, the, the 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 unique thing about matcha is that. It's instead of uh, consuming it in, a, in, 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 in loosely form the way you would most teas, either through a tea bag or, you know, if you're getting fancy or a pot of, of loose leaf tea, you know, usually you just pour hot water over some tea leaves. You wait X minutes, three, four minutes, and then you pour off the, the, the tea and then the leaves remain behind. You either toss the tea bag or, you, uh, you know, you, you, you toss the, the loose leaves. With matcha, it's kind of different. It's ground really, really finely so that it resembles cocoa. So you have this really fine powder instead of just the loose leaves. And uh, when you pour hot water over this powder and you kind of whisk it up, if you just agitate it a little bit, you can do that with any kind of whisk, uh, you consume the whole leaf, right? So you, instead of steeping the tea, you you mix it up with water and you eat it in a way. You, you consume the whole leaf. And, and as a result of consuming the whole leaf instead of just the uh, uh, extracting, right? I mean, hot water kind of extracts what it can from, from tea, and you, you drink whatever the water can extract. But, but with matcha, you, drink, you get the whole plant. And for the same reason that you know, eating an orange is a lot better for you than drinking orange juice, um, matcha is roughly, depending on how you measure these things, anywhere between 10 and 20 times uh, healthier than regular green tea because a lot of the action, like the, re- the reason why a lot of your doctors will tell you to uh, drink a couple of cups of green tea uh, every day is that uh, the good stuff really is in the leaves. The, 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 unsolu- the insoluble fibers in the leaves are where all the magic happens. It's where a lot of the polyphenols are. It's where the great uh, 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 the, the amino acids, uh, the EGCGs, we can get into the technical details of, of what exactly is in there. But, uh, but basically, it's much better to consume the whole leaf than to just extract it with hot water. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the difference between a regular green tea from matcha. Does it, does it have I, – I, I fantasize about matcha having this unbelievable – story or origins, you know, thousands of years ago in Japan. Does, does it have uh, something like that? Oh, absolutely. It? Oh, my God. The, the story of matcha is, uh, is, is pretty fascinating. It goes way back. And it, it's kind of interested. Uh, it's kind of linked to what I said earlier about my, my first uh, contact with, with, uh, with, with matcha and with Japanese culture in general. It was through Zen Buddhism. So there, there was a there was a Zen Buddhist in the 12th century named Asai who, who uh, made a trip to China. And, uh, they used to do this back then, and they would they would learn what they can, and they'd go on these study missions, and, and they would bring back these findings, kind of like research studies. And uh, it turned out that that some some Chinese Zen monks 
we're, uh, we're, we're taking um, uh, parts of the plant and kind of packing them together in these little discs. And it, 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 uh, it, was, it was really for transporting the tea uh, in a safe way. A, a lot like Pu'er has done today. They, they kind of compact it into these like hockey pucks. And then you could, you could break off a piece whenever you wanted and put it into a mortar and pestle. And you'd kind of grind it up, add some hot water over it, and uh, just drink the whole thing. And these Chinese monks discovered that if you did this, uh, it had some it had some medicinal properties. Of course, we understand these properties a lot better today than than they did back then. But they knew intuitively that it was good for certain for uh, illnesses and ailments. And also, they found it kept them pretty awake during these intense periods of meditation. So these Japanese monks that went over there and learned all this, they brought all this knowledge back to Japan. It kind of fell out of favor in China for, for kind of mysterious reasons that was replaced by other Chinese teas. But it really took root in Japan in, in right around the, the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. And it was the Zen monks who, uh, who, who were responsible for that. And uh, in, in those days, in medieval Japan, um, a lot of the, the aristocracy, a lot, a lot of the, the upper classes w- would take their kind of social cues and mores from the, from the Zen monks. They had a lot of sort of cultural cachet, and they discovered that the monks were drinking this tea in this kind of unusual way, and they kind of took off the practice, and, and uh, they sort of started adding a lot more uh, rules and, and choreography to this process of, the simple process of making a cup of matcha over the centuries, um, and it, it basically the reason was that you could prove that you were kind of a cultured person, a, a person of good, upstanding breeding and all that, by, by demonstrating that you could make this elaborate tea. And so from that, the, the whole tea ceremony was, was born, and you know over the centuries, uh, it, it kept getting more and more ornate, essentially. And it, it still goes on today. Um, it, 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 it really does have this fascinating history. Uh, uh, women, especially in Japan, can, um, uh, they, they can enroll in, and this is today, contemporary Japan, they, they can enroll in these, these tea courses that you, you study matcha formally and you make matcha formally for guests. And uh, the, the, the real reason, they, the, I, I think, in my opinion, that what's really going on is that you can demonstrate you have a great deal of, of grit and, and kind of um, the ability to stick to something for a long time. It takes 10, 20, 30, often 40 years, often an entire lifetime to formally study tea and to teach tea. And by going through this, you, you can you really prove that you're a person of, uh, of integrity and you, you, you have a lot of you know, stick-to-itiveness and grit and you can get through things. And it's a, it's a highly desired trait in, in contemporary Japanese society. So, so a lot of women in particular um, uh, want to become uh, fluent in the art of tea. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing something very different with, with what we're doing with the matcha um, than that. But, but traditionally... Um, the, the whole art of the tea ceremony has this has this type of history that I just outlined. Yeah, to, to me, it's uh, it's just such a great cultural thing, and it's something that you know you don't want to lose because we we lose so much of our so much of this culture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and like I said, for me, uh, nostalgic wise, I could remember it in um, <laughs> karate. Yeah. but uh, <laughs> that sounds That's kind funny. of ridiculous. No, no, no. It's great. It's actually, it's fine. And and today, uh, a lot of people's first uh, uh, encounter with matcha is at a place like Starbucks. I mean, about eight or nine years ago, Starbucks introduced their first matcha, and it was a great hit. And they've they've had it ever since. Now they they load it up with with enough fat and sugar to make it a matcha milkshake. Essentially, it's not really a tea. What they serve, it's more like a you know a, a calorie bomb. But but it's it 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 is people's first experience with matcha and and that's good anything that that gives them uh it's a lot like karate kid anything that gives you that first exposure is is worthwhile and and some people get intrigued by it and they want to take a deeper dive and that's when they find somebody like me right now how (laughs) how is it produced uh uh, because matcha is much different you said it's a powder you consume the whole leaf how is it different from regular green tea like uh production yeah 
they they kind of like like a lot of things in Japan. They they take these these really kind of obsessive deep dives into into things, you know. And and, and Japanese farmers who specialize in matcha are, are certainly no exception. So what they do is they they it, it starts uh, with the with the cultivation of it. They found through trial and error that if you um, in the old days this is how they did it. They would they would uh, erect these bamboo poles around the perimeter of the tea fields, and then they would uh, take some hemp string and uh, kind of tie it around the top of the poles to create this sort of stringed faux ceiling, okay? And so there was uh, this kind of like string uh, crisscrossing over the, over the tea field. And on that string, they would uh, toss hay just using pitchforks. They would just toss hay over that so that the straw would catch over this faux ceiling and create a kind of shade for the, for the tea fields. And if you, they found that if you shaded the tea and, uh, the more sunlight you could block, the more interesting the tea became. And, uh, it, it turns out that if, if tea or, or many plants actually, but, but especially the Camellia sinensis plant, if it's robbed of sunlight for an extended period, and they do this for about a month, you know, something like a month, six weeks sometimes, uh, it, then the plant has this really specific reaction. Like it begins to cr- uh, crank out chlorophyll. So the, the color of the, of the leaves really changes because it, it can't process any, it's not do, undergoing any photosynthesis and the plant is striving to keep alive and it's cranking out chlorophyll. And it's also cranking out all kinds of, of protein uh, building blocks, amino acids that lend all kinds of interesting flavors to the, to the tea when, once it's harvested. So, you know, they found that by robbing the plant of sunlight, um, you could create uh, a, a product that was uh, uh, quite unique. They don't, they don't really do this with regular green tea. I mean, some are shaded. Uh, some of the, re- the more refined yokoros are shaded, but, but most aren't. It's just, you know, grown out in an open field. And, uh, uh, you know, um, it's that, that's basically how it's done. It, it goes on from there. So once it's, once it's harvested, um, they, they steam it to preserve this lovely color, and, and then they put it in these big drying rooms. They're really kind of medieval looking. They're like big uh, blow dryers in chicken wire. Imagine a huge box of chicken wire, and uh, this warm air is kind of blowing around, and all these, all these baby green leaves are, are floating up in the air, drying. So once it's dried, they put it in, they store it in freezers, and then when they're ready to grind it, they pull it out of the freezer. And they put it uh, in between these wonderful uh, uh, artisanal um, granite wheels, and they're about two, two and a half feet in diameter. The, these these wheels made of granite, and on the on the interior side of these wheels are these grooves that these these tea artisan guys do it all by hand. And uh, uh, the 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 idea is that the granite wheels rotate uh, against one another, and that they very very slowly grind these whole leaves that have just been poured in there into this very, very fine uh, green powder, which is called matcha at this point. Before that, it's called tencha. The whole, the whole leaf is called tencha. The ground leaf is called matcha. And uh, it's, it's a very slow and painstaking process. It takes about an hour to grind 30 grams, which is the, 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 the unit we typically sell it in. Uh, one gram is considered to be one serving of matcha. So uh, it takes a whole hour to do 30 servings of matcha, and uh, you can't go any faster because if the wheels go faster, they will scald the tea. Friction will heat it up and actually uh, burn it. It will, it will kind of scald it because these tea leaves are very, very delicate. Um, and then once, once it's ground, it's, it's kind of ready to be shipped out and ready to be consumed uh, by, by a tea teacher or by uh, just any old consumer like you and me. So it's an elaborate process for sure. Right. I'm assuming that's why it's so much more expensive than other teas then, because of this whole process. Indeed. It, it, it's a very, very, very labor-intensive thing. It, it can't really be scaled. Um, uh, it, 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 you, you can't, there's not much you can do to kind of increase yields. Uh, I mean, you, there are some things you could do. You could buy more land. And, but but um, a lot of the, the, the teas that we specialize in, we, we call them hyper-premiums, um, they, they take a minimum of 30 years to 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 grow. They, they, they produce the, the finest tasting leaves, um, so it, it's it's pretty hard to be a startup in the in the matcha world because you've got a 30 year wait right. from day one. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah. So is 
is because we're in this age is is organic how important is organic matcha compared to other things that are have really importance if that they need to be organic and other things you yeah. can probably get away with how important is is this I, you know i think i personally think it's not very important in japan because um, agricultural standards there are, are quite strict um, to to get certified organic in japan is, uh, is 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 a very elaborate and expensive process, and a lot of these these Japanese farmers who specialize in matcha um, just aren't that interested in in going through it. it. But that said, they're using these really time tested techniques that that there's nothing there's nothing scary about them. They don't they don't get sprayed anything like that. Um, they've been doing it the same way forever, which is very very uh, labor intensive, kind of you know hand process oriented. So I think you know matcha is one of those things. It's 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 uh, you know it's grown out in the open air. It's it they, the the fertilizers used are are natural. They they tend to be uh, fish meal based. Uh, one of my growers, uh, a particularly obsessive uh, grower, um, likes to go down to the fish market every day during uh, the last part, right before harvest, last couple of months before harvest. He goes down to the fish market every day. He buys. He looks for the cheapest fish he can find. He doesn't care. All he's looking at is the price tag, okay? And he'll buy a whole bunch of it. He'll take it home. He'll put it through a meat grinder and, and create this paste. And then he'll apply that directly to the root ball of his most prized uh, uh, plants. And that has this tremendous effect of, of giving the tea, uh, you know, all kinds of flavor profiles that it probably wouldn't have had he not done this. So, you know, it, it the, They've been at this a really long time. Um, there's really nothing sort of Monsanto-ish about the process. Uh, uh, it, now that said, um, some people, it's the word organic is is a kind of uh, magic word. I mean, if it doesn't have the organic label stamped on it, they're just not interested. So there there is a market for the stuff for for uh, organic matcha um, because of this perception that. You know, it has to be organic to be any good. Now, the other thing to say about organic is um, because during the shading process that I mentioned before, um, with an organic process, uh, it, they're limited to what they can do during the shading process. Uh, for example, in traditionally grown matcha, conventionally grown matcha, because the, uh, the plant is shaded and it's very, very dark in there, there's almost no light, um, the the Plants do get this kind of nitrogen bath. Like what happens is they they, they go down below the roots and they, they create this nitrogen rich water and they run that water through the through the uh, the, the roots of the plant. And um, with certified organic, they can't do that. So that's that's really the only difference. But but it's a big difference because uh, during the shading process, you know, the, the plant is essentially dying, right? I mean, it's been robbed of its sunlight. And it's trying to stay alive, and it's cranking out chlorophyll, and it's cranking out amino acids, doing all the stuff. But without some kind of uh, energy boost, i.e., from the from the nitrogen, it's hard for the plant to remain really kind of vibrant and uh, and healthy. So um, conventionally grown matcha typically is uh, a lot tastier than organic matcha, even though the organic matcha is going to be quite a bit more expensive, and that it has this you know reputation of being if so facto, better than non-organic matcha. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, um, an unusual situation there. I mean, it's not like blueberries where it's, it's clear that you really ought to be eating organic blueberries versus not organic blueberries. Um, it's very different. But so with matcha, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, it's, it warrants anything to worry about to not drink organic matcha. And certainly if you're into, into it from the Epicurean angle, if you want it to taste better, conventional matcha is, is the way to go. Oh, that's that's fascinating. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. how, how about Mike Michael? Is there anything that grows on tea that's a concern? The audience should be concerned of, or that's not really an issue either. To my knowledge, not really. You, are you talking about like molds or something? Mm -hmm, like that? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think I think the care going into this process. I mean, Japan is a is a very humid place, especially in the summer. I mean, there is a lot of humidity. People do have have mold in their houses for sure, but. Uh, you know the, the steaming process and the whole way that it's it's done would uh, tend to take care of any any mold issues. I, I've never run into a mold issue, and we've done 
we've done a lot of testing on it. So I, I think I think we can we can confidently say that that there's no mold in this stuff. Yeah. That's that's good because some people are going to be concerned about that. So I just I, I have absolutely to that for sure for sure. And it's now, a legitimate concern. Yeah, it sure is. Now most people have an idea that green tea is really healthy. And there's some components that I'm familiar with, and maybe there's some that I'm not that I'd like you to discuss. But, I mean, there's there's ECGC, which you commented on. There's poly, mm-hmm. polyphenols, you mentioned yep. chlorophyll. And then uh, my most famous would, favorite would be caffeine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I guess the, maybe theophylline or theanine, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. But what are yeah. some of these, these chemicals or components that really, you know, give matcha its really healthful punch? Yeah, I mean, well, let's start with the caffeine. I mean, that is one. Uh, th- there are lots of demonstrated health benefits to having a small amount of caffeine in your diet. It does keep you very alert, which is useful. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and, um, you know, um, there, the one that you mentioned before, L-theanine, is a very interesting uh, molecule, very interesting substance. Um, it's been shown in, in – in laboratories that, uh, in, in very, I, I can talk about this study in a second, but it's been shown that uh, l theanine in the bloodstream has a really unique effect on the brain. It, what happens is that alpha waves begin to get generated. For whatever reason, there's some kind of link between l theanine in your bloodstream and how your brain, uh, uh, the, the, I don't want to say processes electricity, but, but it exhibits uh, a different wavelength when this is present. So the, the alpha waves are kind of stimulated when l goes into your system. And uh, it's, it's, it's super interesting. Um, probably about 10 years ago, down at Stanford, they, did, they have a famous uh, sleep center down there, and they were really trying to understand all these different waves, like the electrical wavelengths in the brain, the alpha waves, the gamma waves, the beta waves. And uh, they invited the, the Dalai Lama was, was, was in the Bay Area, and they invited him down, and they thought that it would be interesting to test uh, and, and to rig up uh, the Dalai Lama and several of his, uh, his chief guys around him, the very experienced meditators. They've been meditating three hours a day for you know, 70 years. Um, and what they did was they, uh, they, uh, they hooked up a bunch of equipment and they uh, asked them to do their normal three-hour morning meditation while being you know, hooked up. And they, they produced all kinds of data out of this. But, but what they really found was that when uh, during some of the deepest uh, uh, sections of the meditation – that these alpha waves were were produced, which was a really really interesting find. No one had really known that apparently before that. But uh, so w- when you're in a meditative state, you're you're it, it, under uh, alpha waves. Uh, it's 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 a very interesting one because you are um, you're very awake yet you're extremely relaxed at the same time. So that's kind of it. Almost sounds like a contradiction. Most people, if you're if you're extremely relaxed, you're sort of going to sleep. But when you're in a deep meditation state, you're you're both. You're both deeply relaxed and you're and you're very awake at the same time. You're very alert. You're very aware. Um, and l theanine, it turns out, you know, is very similar. So if 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 you can get into an alpha wave state via l theanine, it just seems to be another avenue. Uh, of getting there uh, in addition to meditation, which I find really interesting. So that's why sometimes I call it a kind of liquid meditation. And I'm sure that it has something to do with uh, the, the origins that we talked about before. Uh, you know, when Zen monks realized, uh, you know, they didn't really know anything about l in the 12th century, um, but they did know that uh, somehow after drinking this tea, they felt both relaxed and very awake and they were able to uh, do these kind of extended meditation uh, sessions uh, with this tea. That's how it became popular. So, you know, that's a that's an extremely interesting uh, part of the matcha story as far as, um, uh, you know, it, the interesting stuff inside matcha. The other one you mentioned and that I mentioned before is is uh, something called EGCG. It's uh, epigallo uh, catechin gallate. And uh, that is has been linked in all kinds of interesting uh, scientific and medical studies to for its effect on on cancerous cells it's it's really very interesting it often it often induces something called apoptosis which is a, a spontaneous sort of just death of a cell and for whatever reason uh, uh, cells that are exponentially multiplying when they run into this egcg they they run into kind of interference it, it, it doesn't like it now it, it, the mechanism hasn't been 
uh, proved in a in a causal sense, but there are enough studies. There, there are a couple hundred studies at this point uh, that suggest that uh, large quantities of EGCs in your system during, for example, uh, uh, or in conjunction with uh, chemo and radiation is extremely helpful, which is why a lot of oncologists recommend uh, a couple of cups of green tea while you're while you're undergoing these things. So it's it's it's. You know, it's not proven. You have to be careful of what you say about this stuff. But but it's one of those things where why wouldn't you try it? I mean, if you've if you've got some kind of cancer and you're undergoing treatment, you, you know, you want to you want to you want to do everything you can to make this treatment successful. And if 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 having a cup of green tea uh, is is beneficial, I, it, it's hard to find a reason why you wouldn't do it. Right. Right. So, so that's that's kind of a very interesting uh, part of green tea as well, especially matcha, because uh, it has roughly twenty times the EGCGs of regular green tea. And again, it, it has to do with this reason of consuming the whole leaf versus uh, just extracting it uh, with a, the, the way you would steeping a regular green tea. It only exists in the insoluble fibers. In other words, so if you're if you're if you're Having a cup of green tea and the hot water is extracting it, it's only getting what's soluble. Whatever the whatever the hot water can dissolve of that good stuff is what you get. But a lot of the good stuff isn't soluble at all. It's in an insoluble form. So you have to actually consume the leaf in order to get the benefit. What about is, is e, EGCG a polyphenol then, or is that some and hold another different kind of compound? It, it, it is a polyphenol. Um, it, it's also called a flavonoid to make things right. really confusing. Um, <laughs> and, and the broader category of all of these things are called catechins to make it even further confusing. So uh, under the rubric of catechins, you have you have flavonoids and polyphenols. Um, yeah, and that, that's it, you, you could get into much more technical aspects of it, but it, that's basically um, the, the structure of it. No, thank thank you. That that clears up things for me for sure. Now, how do you how do you tell a good matcha from a bad matcha? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's hard to tell just from from looking. Like you're in a store, you're in Whole Foods, and you come to the tea section, and there are a bunch of uh, nowadays uh, they have a couple of selections of matcha in there, and it's just a little canister, and you know you can't really tell anything except for what the label says, and it doesn't say much because nothing is regulated. Uh, it might say something like ceremonial matcha, which people think is a good thing, uh, <laughs> but it, 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 because there's no regulation on what people can label it, um, it you can call anything ceremonial, even if it's not ceremonial. It just sounds like one of those marketing words. But, uh, um, yeah, basically, when, the only way you can tell good matcha from bad matcha is to open it up and look at it and smell it and taste it. Um, so if you've, if you've got a white piece of paper and you take out some matcha from matcha A, can matcha A, and take out some matcha from can matcha B, and put them next to each other, um, the, the brighter one, the brighter the tea color, the, almost the more fake looking green it is i mean it's some the, the best matcha is so really vibrant vibrant vibrantly bright that it almost looks like something's been added to it but it hasn't it's really just it, that's that's the way it expresses itself most matcha on the marketplace is what i call culinary matcha and it's it's quite yellowed um there's almost like a, it, it, it there, there's yellow in it there's brown in it, it there's not this really super vibrant green so color is your is going to be your your first and most immediate way to tell good matcha from bad matcha. But again, you can't tell the color until you've opened the can. So, you know, it's it's a bit of a conundrum there. But uh, and then aroma is the next one. You put your face right in it, and it really should smell fresh. It should smell it, uh, all kinds of aromas. Cacao, like a raw cacao, is really what it should smell like. It almost smells like raw chocolate. Uh, it, it, the good stuff, and you'll, 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 there are other aromas in there, but that's kind of the, the predominant one. With bad matcha, the predominant aroma is, I would call it hay, or uh, just kind of like straw. It just tastes like, uh, or it smells like a barn, kind of just barny, a little bit on the straw side, and uh, it doesn't smell anything like chocolate. Uh, so that's another way. Um, obviously, tasting is 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 the main way. It it should taste really good. If it doesn't taste good, you know, and a lot of a lot of people come to matcha and they they try it for the first time. They try something from Trader Joe's or they try you know Starbucks or they try something else that's on sale. They've seen in an Asian market or whatever. And a lot of that stuff that they're selling is is just 
it's it's a rational decision not to like it. A lot of it is quite vile. Um, the, what they're really using in those leaves are, are uh, the entire plant. Um, for, for, for the really hyper-premium good matcha, we only use the new growth. Whatever grows from, say, uh, early winter until uh, mid-spring. It's harvested mid-spring. It's harvested in late April. Uh, whatever grows during that time, it's just these baby leaves that are on top. They're the, they're the newest growth. That's what we use for, for the really the best stuff. But for, for most people, uh, the yields aren't, for most matcha producers, um, the yields aren't big enough to, uh, to make it a viable business, really. Um, and so they take leaves from the entire plant. So they're taking leaves that are, you know, many years old. And throwing them into these big industrial grinders, uh, you know, they, they don't take the time to remove the backbone from each of these leaves. You know, some of the things that the obsessive farmers that we talked about before do, they, they don't bother to go through any of that because it's, it's expensive to do all that. Uh, and so they just kind of grind up a bunch of mediocre tea leaves and declare it matcha. And it's, it's, it's really quite bitter and unpleasant. And if, but if you throw enough fat and sugar at it, you know, like they do at Starbucks, I mean, everything tastes good as a milkshake. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, well, um, Eric, so let me ask you this. How much of an abomination is something like, cause I, I, I know, I know you sell it and we're going to talk about breakaway in, in a minute, yeah. but I, I like cold brew matcha and I like mm -hmm. hot matcha. I probably like it cold, uh, Probably more, and I think that's the way mm -hmm. my wife drinks it. Is that like a total abomination, or is not that at all? Like no, 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 it, no. It's not an abomination. Drinking it cold is actually wonderful. It's uh, uh, it, it's so refreshing in the summertime, and it's it's a little less hassle to prepare. And it also the um, it, it's something to do with the human palate, but but the human palate cannot taste bitter notes at certain temperatures at, at around 38 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very difficult to taste uh, bitterness. And so you can take a, a kind of subpar matcha and uh, drink it ice cold. It's going to taste much better than it will if you drink it hot because the hot brings out all it, uh, these, the bitter qualities of the leaves um, are, 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 are kind of expressed through heat. And they're not expressed through uh, when, when the temperatures are in, in the high 30s. So it, there's absolutely nothing wrong. There's no abomination whatsoever to drinking it cold. It's a, it's a total pleasure to do. Um, so yeah, don't take that. And the only the only thing I would say with abomination, and and again, this is kind of a rational decision. But if you've got a, a subpar matcha on your hands and you don't want to waste it, um, it's it sort of the only way to make it palatable is is to to throw a bunch of fat and sugar at it. So if you sweeten it up with your you know your honey or your agave or your maple syrup or even just sugar, um, and you add some half and half or some cream or some whole milk or whatever it is, and you shake it up, you know you now you're talking about kind of a green milkshake type drink, and that that does make bad matcha palatable, and that's that's how that's how a lot of people experience it. If they just drink it with hot water, they're they're going to be in for kind of a, a an unpleasant surprise, you know. And and, and and that's not even you know an abomination either. At least it's a way to to get this down. But it's it's really a not a very healthy habit. I mean, you know, the more we hear about the story of sugar, the more the more we realize what a, what a pretty toxic substance this stuff is, right? So we we really don't want to be sweetening everything uh, if if we care about our health. Um, so from that. That stance, you know, uh, drinking better matcha doesn't doesn't need to be sweetened. There's no no sugar added at all. So, uh, you know, um, that that's what I would say about that. Cool. So, please, at this point, I'd, I'd like you to talk up break, breakaway. Why it's so special, quality, unique products. And for me, like I've been consuming your product now for I don't know six, seven, eight months. I've tried yeah, yeah. a couple different flights. I've tried a couple of different cold brews. Um, next time I purchase, I'll buy some of the, the salt with the mod because I thought that was really yeah. cool. But uh, uh, talk a little bit about – I mean, the, the most recent thing I got, I got a bunch of different blends, like Blend 100 and Blend 93 and all mm -hmm. these different things, and I'm trying to sift my way through it. I know. It's confusing. We, we have 17 blends of matcha, 17 grades of matcha, and we, we grade them internally. Uh, and it's done via some of the things that I just mentioned. It's done via – uh, color, aroma, 
but it's also something called how much uh, something called umami, which is uh, uh, many of your listeners probably know what this word means, but but a lot probably don't either. It's it's a Japanese word that means um, if you directly translate it, it's something like savory deliciousness, which sounds ridiculous. It doesn't sound like anything, but but it's basically the presence of glutamic acids on the palate. Um, a, a lot of naturally occurring foods with high umami content are things like aged cheeses, you know, Parmesan cheese. Have you ever seen that? That kind of those little white crystals that form on a on a Parmesan, a really beautiful aged Parmesan or an aged right. howda, and it looks like salt crystals, but it's not. Those are little glutamate crystals. If you put one of those glutamate crystals on the on the middle of your tongue and you just taste it, it's amazing what happens. You begin to sort of wildly and involuntarily salivate. It's really super interesting. And these glutamic acids go into our system, and they're aided by the production of saliva, and uh, they make foods taste really good. An another one is uh, miso soup. If you ever take a, a sip of miso soup and your whole mouth kind of lights up with this brothy, uh, savory deliciousness, this umami, that, I mean, that's one. Um, seaweed is another one. Uh, the, the Maillard reaction when you when you grill meats is, is another one. Like if you just taste a, a piece of grilled meat and that, that kind of that outside little, little crusty part is full of glutamic acids that, that get expressed. Um, all of that is umami and, and uh, matcha has a ton of umami. That's kind of the holy grail. It's like the more umami the matcha has, the better it tastes. And so we, we try to figure out how much umami all these blends have. And, and as you go up in the blends, they start at the, at the blend 93, as you mentioned. They go, they go all the way up uh, to something called the blend Daphne. Um, that the, the umami uh, increases as you go up in the blends. Also, the, the natural sweetness of the tea increases as you go up in the blends. Um, uh, uh, we, we, it, it's all about finish, for example. It's a lot like wine. Like uh, it, you, After you swallow it, how long does it remain in your mouth? Like, how long can you taste it? Uh, the, how long does it just kind of keep singing after you swallow it? We literally take a stopwatch and we, and we time it to figure out how long uh, the finish is. All of those things get, get kind of added up and uh, become benchmarks for grading different, different, uh, different quality matcha. And so we, we've come up with, uh, with 17 so far. Um, and it is confusing for the novice for sure. Uh, it, it, but um, if if you're intrigued and your listeners are intrigued, it's it's better to start with kind of the lower ones, the less expensive ones, to make sure that you are you know that you like it. I mean, some people some people like it and some people don't. I mean, I think most people uh, who are interested in their health and who are interested in food really take to matcha quite quickly. But for others, you know, their 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 palates are just different, and they're just you know. They either need to put a lot of sugar in it to make it palatable or, you know, they're just not interested in it. But basically, um, you start with the with the lower, more affordable blends and you, you kind of work your way up from there as, as you as you get into it. Now, are all your blends from Japan or does, does any yes. happen in the United States? No, unfortunately, I, you know, I've looked into it um, I, and I've talked to a lot of growers, a lot of farmers about this. And, and it, there seem to be very specific growing conditions that are really kind of perfect in Japan. Again, it's like the wine world, you know, like why is it that, that you know, the, the Burgundy region of France and, and the Napa Valley in California and certain parts of Australia, there, 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 are these, there are these little pockets in the world that really seem to produce some of the world's great wines. And, and it can't be done in places like, uh, you know, Canada and Mexico. Um, I mean, it probably could be with a lot of technological help, but but traditionally it, it's, it hasn't been. And it's I think it's the same with with matcha. There, there are certain regions in Japan that uh, are just very conducive to producing uh, these really great teas. Um, the, the main growing region in Japan, a place outside of Kyoto called Uji, uh, is 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 a valley. Uh, it's this uh, they call it a bonchi in Japanese. And it's this valley, and and it's at the bottom of the valley. It's very humid. It's really hot in the summers. It's really cold in the winters. It's very wet. Um, it seems to be the ideal environment for this stuff. And, and there really isn't a place like that in, in, in the United States. I think the closest would be somewhere like Kentucky um, that does have a lot of high humidity and it's got these kind of low-lying valleys and stuff like that. But um, the, 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 the amount of, of, um, of effort that goes into uh, producing, you know, great matcha, again, I mentioned that, you know, the plants have to be 30 years old to start producing really fine, fine stuff. Um, puts a lot of people off right there. I mean, it would be, it would have to be a very far-sighted uh, endeavor to 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 start to do this. And it doesn't mean people can't try. And I've, some people in Hawaii have tried, 
and I've, I've tried some of those, and they're, they're okay. But um, so far, uh, the only place that's been able to do this is, is in Japan. Fascinating. So I have two final questions, and I, and I hope you indulge me. The first sure. one is the day in the life of Eric. How does it start, <laughs> and how does it end? What, what, is it, what does your day look like every day? Well, of course, it starts with a bowl of matcha. You know, you gotta, <laughs> gotta just start the day right. <laughs> no, but um, I, I, I tend to, you know, I, you mentioned in the beginning that I, that I like to cook. I, I do. I, I tend to make a, a pretty good breakfast that's that's very um, nutrient dense. I, I, I like a lot of eggs and avocado, and, and uh, I, I, I have I eat a lot of fish like sardines and mackerel and stuff like that. And uh, um, so I, I try to I try to start the day well. Um, with, with some, some very nutrient dense breakfasts. Um, and then I, you know, I show up at work and, you know, doing my thing and, and I typically bring my lunch. And, and again, it's, 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 it's usually whatever I cooked the night before. And I, 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 I try to put some effort into it, but you know, without going too crazy. And, um, and I try to get a little bit of, I try to keep moving. Of course, you know, the, the more we learn about, about optimal health, it, a lot of it's about movement. Um, so many of us have these sedentary lifestyles, including me, if I, if I, if I lapse, but I do try to, to get up and, uh, and do, do some, some, some interval training. Um, it turns out that, that, uh, trying to mimic, um, how our, our great ancestors did. A lot of the paleo people kind of understand this, but, but, um, sprinting is, probably a lot more beneficial than, than jogging for 45 minutes. And there's lots of interesting reasons why, but, but I do try to get out and just run around. Um, uh, I, I feel better when I do. It just, it just kind of works for me. And it, I really recommend it to people. Um, and then, you know, I've come back in the afternoon and, uh, just more, I'm usually working and reading and, 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 and uh, uh, get trying to get a lot done and 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 then i i go home for dinner and i have a, a young daughter and my wife and i uh put together pretty nice uh pretty nice dinners and we try to spend a lot of time together and not have a whole lot of stress in our lives so i think if you and and sleep is kind of important too of course i mean you have to have a really decent bed you're going to be in bed for 30 your life you might as well you might as well <laughs> try to <laughs> try to try to make that experience as, as good as possible um so i think if you can if you can really if you can sleep well, if you can if you can get a lot of movement during the day, and you can give your body as many nutrient dense foods as possible, that really is uh, is, a, is a pretty good pretty good head start on, on how to lead a healthy life. My my God, well said. Now, can a tea purveyor and lover and business owner still enjoy a great cup of coffee? Oh yes, you know it's like people who. You know, say, are you a dog person or a cat person? Well, you know, I happen to love both. And I actually love great coffee. I mean, I, I don't like supermarket coffee. I'll, I'll pass on that. But but some of the, I mean, there's one of life's great pleasures is, is a great cup of coffee. And I, there's no reason why you couldn't enjoy that. I mean, unless you're caffeine sensitive and all this other stuff. Unless you've got medical reasons why you shouldn't be drinking coffee. Uh, you know, why why, why would you, why would you deny yourself that great pleasure? <laughs> and how can our audience find out more about Breakaway Matcha? Well, the website's the best place to learn about it. It's just breakawaymatcha.com. It, it's all outlined in, in great detail there. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we will be unleashing a, a whole new revamp of the website in about 10 days. So, um, uh, lots to look forward to there. We, we finally got in our, a research section that I've been wanting to do for a long time. I've collated a whole bunch of uh, medical and scientific studies on the on the uh, of what's been done with green tea and matcha in the, in the medical community, and uh, so we've got we've got a lot of those uh, studies that'll be published there. There's um, uh, we, we we did something called the Matcha Academy, which goes into great detail about a lot of the technical aspects of of some of the things we've talked about, how it's grown, uh, you know, its history. Uh, uh, lots of, uh, of, of tutorials on how to how to make a great cup, either hot or cold, um, you know, stuff like that. So we're trying to we're trying to educate people on this on this great great beverage. Um, I, I think it's still sort of inning one in, in this world of matcha. Most people in the world have not really heard of it. Even sophisticated people. Last night I was with these uh, people in San Francisco who are these great chocolatiers. I mean, they're just super urbane. San Francisco chocolate people, and they didn't even know about matcha. I mean, if if somebody like that doesn't know about it, I mean, it, it's it's 
it's it's not un, hard to understand why that that most of uh, most of the world hasn't really heard about it. So it's very early in the game, and it, um, I'm I'm really excited about about the possibilities of 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 how matcha can can really help people um, have a better daily life. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but for our audience, you're offering a, a 10% off and free same day shipping if they use the code BYWG. Correct. That's exactly right. We definitely encourage people to do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any last words, Eric? No, it's just a, a real pleasure to talk to you, uh, Noah. It's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, get up from your desk and move around is what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. Leaving a review and rating on iTunes help us move up the chart and helps us um, helps more people find us. You can subscribe to our incredible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. And as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. That's... That was a great. I had an awesome time doing that interview. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Noah. It's a total pleasure. Yep. I will. Like I said, I will let you know when it's released. All right. Sounds great. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too, All man. Right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.